Chateau Clair was brought by Dr. John Delacour in 1918. He lives here now during part of each summer before returning to California for the winter months. This film is intended to tell something of his life story. for a long time and people always um, discuss and say how old really is Jean Delacour? Well, I'm going to be 94 next September. 94. So you were born in 1890? Yes. And wh whereabouts were you born? Well I was born in Paris, in the heart of Paris. My parents had a house in the Avenue de l'Opéra. They were already apartment there. Nowadays you can't be born there because it's all business. Yes, yes. But it was residential in those days. And you were always born and died in Paris, even if you were really from the provinces, because of the better doc doctors and nursing homes and whatnot. So you went there to born and to die? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then your childhood, that was your family home in, in Picardy? Yes. At Villa? Yes. Uh, we went there in the summer, we went there from June to the beginning of October. Yeah. Is that where your interest in, in plants and birds first began? Yes, and also by grandma, yes. There were a pheasant tree, you know, and all that, and greenhouses with a few orchids, nobody looked after, but they, well, the gardeners looked after, but... Uh, and, uh, but my grandmother had a large place at Neuilly, about six acres, I think, and uh, she had orchid houses, and there was a Chinese pavilion, tea pavilion with a little waterfall, and there were mandarin ducks and Carolina ducks, at the, which had my very much when I was two or three years old. And how did you get your first aviary? Well, my first aviary, I don't know, I, uh, when I was five, four, five years, six, five years old, my parents, I was already crazy about birds and things, and um, my parents gave me a large cage in the bathroom of my nursery in Paris. That was not, was near Saint Augustine in those days, in Madrid. And, um, and I had canaries there. And very soon the canaries, I thought, were too inferior, so I had finches. And, uh, well, I was five years old. And then my father, who died in 1905, uh, was amused that I liked birds and plants, I think, and encouraged it. And he gave me the pheasant tree at Villers. He said, you do what you like with it. 
and my father, elder brother had bantams and uh, dorky and uh, udon chickens and whatnot. And uh, so I sent that to the farm and uh, made three years of small bird there. Yes. I was, I would say, 10, 11 years old. And it was quite pretty with his gardens, and he, the head gardener was very good. He made little pools and rocks and things. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, as you grew up, you were able to develop your love of birds. Did you have to go out and get a job? No. No, it was not necessary. No, no. In my days, people, of my family situation, it was not supposed to be nice to make more money. So you had to work at things which you didn't pay. Yeah. When you think of it, it's fantastic, but that's the way it was. Yes. Do you think maybe it would be an advantage if more young men could do it? Oh, it was. Because, you see, I never had any difficulty. I did what I liked, except that I had nearly eight years of military service, so that yes. was not so good. But... <laughs> that was when the First World War came along. Yeah. And then at the end of the world, the world already, already changed for the worse. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But by the time of the war, you had a big collection at, at, at Villa. Oh, very big. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because, you see, I was on the ridge, naturally. But my uncle, who my tutor, and my mother used to, uh, my trustee, used to give me enough money from my own income mm -hmm. to buy all those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you built it up and... It's also a good idea. It was better than keeping an opera dancer or something like that. <laughs> and you had tiger fans and cranes and... Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, well, yes. And then when the war started, were you able to keep the collection at Villa? In spite of the war, you, could you keep the birds? Yes. yes. Until 1918, the spring day, and it was destroyed. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And you, you had a, a very distinguished military guest, didn't you? Who came well, yes, because you see the house all through the world was the headquarters of some important general. Yes. yes. And in the 16th, pardon me, early 17th, it was the headquarters of Marshal Foch. Mm -hmm. So when I went there, I always sold to other people. I, I met in my own house all the prime ministers of England, France, and so on. I remember it so well. Yeah. So yeah. people like Clemenceau and Lloyd George would yes. come to your house yes, I, and be welcomed by you as a host. Yes. yes. I used to go and, and, and leave there once in the blue and not very often. But anyway, I, I, they used to give me dinner in my own house, in my own thing, yes. and the next day I gave them dinner in the same thing, I see. in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Fosh and Vegan used to plan their campaign among your In my area. In your area. I had enormous area there, you see. And uh, it was all secluded through a wall, and there were media on both sides. It was about 300 feet long. I mean, there was a large house in the middle. So they were So I used to, I wasn't very far from there. So I used to take a bicycle and about twice a week go there in the evening. And um, I didn't want to be seen, so I went straight to the aviary. Yeah. But I found Fosh and Vigor there, because they used to, to sit there and go discussing quietly among the birds. Did they ask your advice about the campaign or only about the birds? No, they didn't. Have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That's Unfortunately, they said the last offensive of the Germans yes. went right into it and stayed there. Yes. And then it was shelled by both sides. Yes. We had the trenches and, and the Allied side on one th on the west and the Germans on the other. Yes. So that shows there was nothing left. Nothing left in the middle. No. <laughs> so you had to make a big decision to abandon the... the no, but I mean, I had no decision to make it. It wasn't there anymore. No. Yeah. All the trees were gone. And, yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from military things, you had quite a distinguished career in music, I think. Uh, singing oh, well, yes, I used to. Be, yes, oh, yes, I had a very good time of that. Yes. But of course, that doesn't last. You know, when you get to yeah. be 50, it's finished. Your voice finished. <laughs> Your voice finished. Yeah. Yes. What, what sort of music did you sing? Oh, I used to sing uh, 
mostly or Schubert, Schumann, Mussorgsky, yes. and things like that. And then modern art, Debussy, Fauré, uh, Ravel, whom I knew, I sang for them. Yeah. And, and, Fauré also. I sang for them. Yeah. And you see, I had at school his friend called Claude Delvin, who was a composer, and he was the director of the French conservatoire in Paris. So, and he had a place near Dieppe. Yes. So I saw a lot of him. So we had wonderful music there. Yes. yes. <laughs> And um, where my friend the Princess Tour has this wonderful garden now, at Varanville, that was the house of Albert Roussel, who was one of the great composers over there. Yeah. So I sang for him there. Yes, yeah. yes. And at the same time, your interest in birds was being developed by people like Pichot and Boulet. Uh, well, yes. Yeah. That you knew well. Well, they were, yes, they were all people who helped me very much. Yes. And uh, well, there were good collections in those days, you see. Yeah. But you know, Villers was a little town of about 3,500 people. And um, every month, a man came from Paris, a bird dealer, with Indian cages, you know, flat thing, with a tarpaulin on it. And had, he had good things, he had tanijos and sugar birds and things like that, yeah. Australian finches and things. And he sold all that in the town once a month. There were up probably 50 people who had aviaries yes. of exotic birds. In a small well, town, you don't have that now anywhere. No. Oh. No. <laughs> and you knew Hubert Astley well in England, I think, who had oh, yes, great Oh, yes, very much he was my, He had great influence on me. Yeah, he was a wonderful person. Eh? Yes, and... Uh, he helped me a great deal. Yes. Did he have a big collection himself? Oh, yeah. He did. A planche too, and so on. He had a great taste. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then your scientific training, was that all due to Professor Bertrand at, at Lille? Well, yeah. That he, he, he took, made you he, he work? took care of me, all right. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, but he died during the war. Yes. But it was he really who uh, instilled your, your, your training as a scientist, rather oh, yeah. than the yes, dilettante. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, very much so. Yes. And he was very, very stern, and uh, he taught us how to work. He was a strict yes. master. Oh, oh. And uh, well, did me a lot of good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Jean, in 1919, the war was over, and your home was desolated. How did you search for a new place to live? Well, I first thought I would leave Europe. I had enough of that nonsense. And uh, oh, I sort of buy a house in the Canary Island. I nearly did that. And so on. And finally, I thought I'd better stay here. And um, I went to visit with friends, not too far from here, on the hill near Rouen, where it was a wonderful big country place which has been destroyed in the last war, and now you have a town of 30,000 people in a 20 stories building. Yes. <laughs> anyway, in those days, it was you know, a big park with axis deer and things in it and so on. And visiting with them, wherever I went, I saw, I saw houses in England too. And uh, finally, I, f I came here, it was for sale, you see. And I thought it was a suitable place. I needed running water. That's one thing I needed. And then that we have that, yeah. Yes. And uh -huh. then I bought it. So you bought it. I bought it from an old lady who had been an American widow. Yeah. Who yeah. inherited a lot of money from her first husband. And she had mar Mary married uh, a French duke who was a little younger than her. And then that didn't, didn't was well, not a success. She had all the money, and she had bought that from his cousin, the Prince of Bern, you see. And uh, she sold it to me. Yeah. And you got not only a park, but a, a manor house, a chateau, and a medieval castle all yeah. together. Yes, yes, yes. And about 600 acres. And 600 acres. Yeah. And uh, a lake and woodland. Yeah, all the woodlands are there. Yeah. 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 Well, you have to, otherwise, 
<laughs> if you didn't do that, the next thing you would be full of houses here, anyway. Yes. <laughs> and the, the chateau, the most imposing part, oh, when was that built, Sean? Well, these present buildings are really end of the 15th century. Yes. And uh, because in a few words, uh, it was started in the 10th century. The winds be uh, the 10th century yes. for the castle, you see. Yes. And then the man, uh, the, the Lord of Clare, was the more or less legitimate cousin of the, of the conqueror, uh, went to England with him and built a castle at Tonbridge, which is the sister castle to this. Yes. The winds are till there have been there many times. They have all the papers and things. And then, well, they commuted between the two countries, you know. And uh, finally, there were wars between the various sections. And then uh, that was demolished here in the 12th century, rebuilt in the 13th. These back walls here are 13th century. Yes. And uh, re-demolished in the 14th and rebuilt in the 15th. And then in the 19th century, they made a park and all that, which never existed before. You see, the people run around everywhere, yeah. The room where we sit here was the Hall of Justice, you see. This is the Hall of Justice yeah, where the yeah. Lord and, and the little, build, little building you go through to go to the chateau from here, the terrace, was called the Passage of the High and Powerful Lords. Yes. So they went from their house to these two and their justice. And what was the rest of the manor house used for? Well, it was the office, really. The offices, yes. Yeah. yes. That's where they administered the countryside. Yes. Because it was a very big uh, thing, many thousands of acres. And then you were able to build up a, a collection of birds and mammals here again when you bought it. Oh, yeah. Um, how, how big did the, the collection become at that time? Oh. I don't know. I never had many mammals on the park animals, you see. The wallabies came from Leonard Schlee. Yes. And, uh, well, as I bought some uh, when the owner died. And uh, so the antelopes came from India and some from French friends who gave me some, you see. We had some in their parks. And, um, I used to have Sudaxis there, which I got from Indochina, I haven't got any of the other axis. There are still some in Europe on this one, I heard that they were destroyed in the war, actually. And, um, but the birds, you see, in those days with Ezra and um, after Speed and Lewis, we used to have uh, collector web. Uh, in Africa, Frost and Schumer in New Guinea and Australia and all that. And uh, uh, Cordier in South America. And they got us the best of everything ever here. We gave a few to the London Zoo. I was a member of the Council of the London Zoo in those days. Yeah. We all were. And, and then they had a good collection in those days. And then we kept the rest, you see. And you would exchange birds between three or four important collections. Oh, well, like yes. Carpenter yeah, yeah. and being there. Well, we kept on, you see, yes. exchanging and giving things one another all the time. And what sort of prices did the birds command in those days? The tracker fans, for instance, were they very expensive and sought no. after? No, no, no. We were used to get them from the, from the place. Yes. From through the Calcutta Zoo and Rangoon Zoo, which were run by English people in those days. And through Sir David Ezra, yes. here in Calcutta, yes, he got the all the Indian things. Yes. Yeah. What sort of price would you have to pay them to get, say, a, a cabbage or a Timmy's tracker pen? Well, a... in this country, before the First World War, they used to hear those things by the hundreds. By the hundreds? You, you, yes, you gave about six pounds a pair for cabbage. You could buy a hundred if you wanted to every year. And Timmy's things. They, Timmings were a little more expensive, you gave 10 pounds, and, uh, and you get uh, 20 pounds for, uh, for city. There was no blaze. I got the blue blaze yes. in, the, in the 30s. 
And the Western track of France, did you have those? No, that has never been a success anyway. The, the early people who read all those pheasants in France have written all that in the old bulletin of the Société de Climatation. And, uh, and uh, they never were successful with this thing. They had them. I think two or three were reared, but otherwise they won't breed. And I still don't believe you are going to breed them in this climate. There is something, I don't know what, but the others were easy, but these things were better. They never did any good with them. And at that time, every country house had its pheasantry and the fancy pheasants that oh, yeah. the people looked up. You see, they all reared pheasants yes. for the shoots, and then they always had a pheasantry where they kept exotic pheasants. It was a fashionable thing to do. Yeah, well, it was. Everybody. Yeah. And they also had conservatories, winter gardens and whatnot for plants, you see, which just totally disappeared. Yeah. And who did you have here as your cur curator to help you look after this big collection? Well, in this country, uh, the idea was to have English people for that for gardens and, and, and aviaries. Yes. And so who, who came as your curator to... Oh, Fuchs. Fuchs. I advertised. She, in the neighborhood here, there was a lady called Madame Le Kelly who had a tremendous collection of birds. Parrots and things and pheasants. She had all the pheasants and things. And uh, she wanted an English keeper. So we put an advert in the uh, in, uh, agricultural magazine and cage birds and she, and so on, and I interviewed, uh, I don't know, a dozen fellows in England, and we kept up two or three, and she had one, and had another one, and uh, Madame Ifri, she was a child, got another one. But she, she, she was crazy, that did work, but the other two were very well. Yeah. And you got Frank Fuchs, who came to work for you? Well, he stayed here. He stayed with me 47 years until he died. Yeah. He was two years younger than me. Yeah. Yeah. And he had to escape during the Second World War, didn't he? Then yes. He came back again afterwards. Yes, because he had not been uh, naturalized French and he would have been locked in. Yeah. So I got him out, you see. Yes. But after the Second World War, he came back and we came back, and declare yeah. all over again. I made him come back to America before I ever came back. Yeah. And then all you wanted to, to do it, I didn't know what to do, you see. And uh, he said, oh, yes, we can make it pay with visitors and things and other. So I said, all right, we'll try it. Because it was a mess, you know. Yes. Yeah. And was there was practically nothing left. Yeah. Wasn't it Fuchs who sent you that terrible ter telegram when you went into China to say that the interior of the Oh, he sent me that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was in 39. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that wasn't funny. No. When I came back, it broke. And you lost in the chateau everything you collected? Yeah, everything. No notes and... Oh, no, this pressure. side wasn't damaged. No, no. And the walls stood up to the fire? Oh, right? well, yes. I mean, By the well, we, put, we put new roofs and uh, windows and that's it. With all your notes and specimens and oh, yes. library was oh, yeah, completely yeah. lost. Oh, yeah. And I had a very good one, actually. Yes, but, uh, anyway, nothing lost in this world. Let me forget that. No. <laughs> no, it was a, a terrible, especially when you were at the other side of the world and couldn't um, do anything about it. No. How do, you, how do you think that happened? Was it an accident or did you never find the cause no, of it? No, no. no, it was not an accident because it burned before the war. Yes, in, yes. Oh, as in, in February. I think. I think somebody did it. Probably stole some valuable paintings or books or something. Yes. Yeah, but and then would put it. light to it to hide the traces. See, the war came within six months and that yes. was the end of that. That was finished, yes. Yeah. Jean, be between the wars, you, you knew virtually everybody who was concerned with birds and uh, met them all, corresponded with them, exchanged oh, yeah, with them yeah, yeah. all together. And people like Professor Gigi, who we never knew, uh, oh, yeah. but he was a, a great um, oh, he scientist. Was a, he was a great person. Yes. He was a professor of zoology and uh, at the University of Bologna, which is the oldest in the world, and he became the director, the president of the university for many years. 
And he had outside of Bologna many acres. It's an old 16th century large villa uh, on top of the hill, the farms and things. And he had a very good collection of peasants in the old days, one of the best. And, uh, well, he lived to be 96, and he was pretty good. But finally he died, and the whole thing is gone now. Yes. And then the Duke of Westminster at Woburn and his son, who was Marcus of Tavistock for many uh, years. Uh, oh, yes. yes. They had an enormous collection, didn't they? Enormous well, the Duke had, and Tavistock had parrots. Yes. But uh, he fell out with his father because he didn't want to be an officer in the war because, you know, he was, he had his own ideas about it. And his father kicked him out, he had his parrot and his wife, and then he went to live in his own house with a small collection of birds. And John Yellen's father used to look after them. Yeah. Yeah. And you exchanged birds with the Duke uh, for a long time? Oh, yeah. Time, I sent him lots of young pheasants. Yes. He let them out in the park, in the had pheasant trees. And, uh, well, he had in the park in perfectly good shape lots of amherst in the woods. And I gave him, see, I got the first blue-eared pheasant. Nobody had them before. We sent somebody. There was a German called Hempe working in a business in Shanghai. He was very nice and he was a good bird man. And he got some Chinese to go and get those things. The first lot got killed by bandits who ate the pheasants. The second lot, I got them and there was about 30 of them. So I sent some to Gigi for safekeeping. I had a man near Marseille in the back hill country there in a different climate, very nice. And I used to entrust him with some pair to have them in different climates. Yes. So we reared a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Also, there were many more males and females in the, in the lot, anyway. And uh, so I sent them the Duke of Bedford. But of course, uh, earth feather and loose are no good at all. They fight and kill everything and kill one another. Yes. <laughs> yes. But anyway. Has there ever been another importation of blue-eared pheasant, or was that the only one that ever no, came in? Never been in They've never been imported since. Not that I think. Maybe no. one pair, but I'm not. No. Well, the brown ones, you know, until quite lately, came from three birds sent to France yes. in about 1850 or something. Yes. Yeah. Incredible inbreeding. Um, yes, but actually they had no sign of it until about 20 years ago. No. And then your great friend Alfred Ezra had a, had a collection of all sorts of birds oh, at well, yes. the Fox Farm, didn't he? You see, Ezra was born in India at Pune. Uh, his mother was his Sassoon, you see there. And um, he was born in India and reared in India. And he came to England soon after the first, before the First World War. The only, and you know how he came to England? He had an expedition through the Himalaya and Kashmir and all that. And through Russia to England. That's how he came to England. That's an unusual way to come. Yeah. And they, they, he had trouble with the Russian, he knows it was a dark day, but they were already a police nation, you see. Yes. But anyway, he went through it. It was unusual. And then there was, he went back to one brother went stayed in India, the other one came to France and married here. And uh, we were all very good friends. Yes. And uh, so he had, before he got married, before the war, he had an apartment in Mount Street, and he had there the first sunbirds he bought from India. Nobody keeps sunbirds before him. Yeah. And hummingbirds after he had. Yes. Yeah. And didn't he keep part of the collection in his own bedroom? Oh, yeah. Yes. He's still in here at Fox Warren, yes? Yes. And looked after them himself. himself. And some good shamas and things. Yes. Yes. And uh, Persian nightingale. And then you worked very closely with Peter Scott, didn't you, for a long time? Oh, well, I knew Peter Scott when he was a boy, actually. Yes, yes. And before the war, the First Second World War, he had a, a lighthouse in Norfolk, and a few geese and things around there. Yes. And he used to come here and so on. Then after the war, in '56, when I returned from America for the first time, 
I went with I went with Hindel, I remember. It was Hindel, it was at the zoo then. Yes. We went with Peter to Slimbridge and I remember it was late in the autumn, November. It was cold and damp and the hotel was cold and damp, you know, just after the war it wasn't very good. Anyway <laughs> and uh, then we went to see the place and uh, he wanted us to tell him which was it was suitable for that purpose. That was the beginning of it. That's the beginning of Slimbridge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and tell me about Herbert Whitley, because uh, until I read your book, I, I never knew about him. Oh, well, he, was a, he had a wonderful collection. He had all sorts of things. And plants and duck, but the best thing he had was his domestic pigeons and some chickens. He had, he had 300,000 or whatever it was. Really? No, no, 3,000. Uh, uh, all uh, uh, pedigree pigeon. He was a fellow who kept the records. Yes. Uh, yeah. yes. And was he well known? Or did he go out and lecture and, and, and show oh, his no, birth? No, no, no. He wouldn't deal to anybody. He, uh, uh, I myself and Ezra and Stephen Stokes were the only people he allowed to come and see him. He went to spend a few days with him. Because he despised and disliked everybody else. He despised and disliked them all? Yeah. Yes. So you and had he had his own yeah. idea, you had, you had to let him say. He had a lot of money, and he had a fairly large house, which should have been preserved because it was, his mother built that in, I would, I would say, 1870, or something. And it was a perfect example of furniture and everything of the period. Yes. Very ugly, but perfect. You have to every detail, you know. He never added anything to it, it's just as it was. And it should have been preserved. It was very interesting. Yes, yeah. yes. And Lord Rothschild, you helped, I think, build up his collection uh, while it was... Ah, yeah, but he had skins. He had nothing alive. No. No, no. Oh, yes, I always gave him things. Yeah. His skin collection was enormous, wasn't it? It was bigger than the British Museum. Oh, yeah. And then it went to America. Then he went through all his money, you know. He had yeah. to sell the bear to the American Museum. He told him himself, here, yeah, poor fellow. Yeah. He did. Yeah. How, how did he do that? It seems well, he just spent too much. Spent too much. <laughs> even for that? Even for a Rothschild. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you see, the English Rothschild were nothing as, as rich as the French ones. Yeah, I, I, know, I know them very well, I mean, I always did. And, um, yeah. And was he very upset at having to sell the collection to, um, to clear his, his debt? Did it, did it upset him a lot to... Oh, yeah, it upset him. It did. He hated it. He told me, he said, well, I had no choice. See, he kept the insect. He had a, a collection of butterflies. Yes. A, as good as anybody. That he... He, he kept. He kept them, yeah, he left yes. the news. And uh, in England, the only scientist you see went down and in because he saw his collection. Well, he had no, 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 no duty to give it to the British Museum. I mean, after all, poor man, he, he had to get some money because his family said, enough is enough, now you don't spend it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you were not a good businessman. Yeah. No, 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 no. But you was very sweet and yes. enthusiastic. He did a lot of good, actually. And then, um, apart from keeping birds and studying them, you helped to form the Bird Preservation Society, didn't you? The ICBP with Gilbert. Oh, Bush. yeah, yeah. We started that just after, the, just before the Second War. Yes. And then went on with it. Because, you see, when I was very young, there were, well, there were a few islands in which had been wiped out. The West Indies, no, but not that. But then uh, the spread of human being everywhere and poisoning everything uh, just started. So you see, we, we had to do something about yes. it. We started mostly with the flamingos in the camera, because people used to, and the uh, puffins and things in the Brittany Island. Yes. People used to go and shoot at them, and they would shoot on, on clay bears, you mm. see. So that was outrageous, and then we stopped that nonsense. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, now there are so many flamingos in the South Island that actually they do damage to crops. Do they? Oh, yes, we have to pay for it. Yes. 
Yes. But they, they, they are now thousands of them, and they are spreading everywhere, which yes. is very good. But at the time, in the 1920s, it was a revolutionary thought that birds needed preserving. No, no. And you and the other person, with Phyllis Barclay Smith, I think, formed ICPP yeah, yeah. and built it up to its present position. Oh. Well, you see now again, the world is spoiled. We have lost two thirds of the breeding bird of this park here. The yeah. last ten years? Have been lost? Oh. Yes. Yeah, they are gone. Yeah. They are poisoned in the fields, mm. up in the plateau. Yes. yes. And that goes far either way. Yes. And at the same time, also, you were associated with the, the hunting organization, the Conseil International de la Chasse. Oh, yeah. Francois Edmund. Yeah, because, I mean, if, if hunting and uh, shooting is properly regulated, it doesn't do any harm. So we have to be friendly with, with them. It's perfectly legitimate. Because if you begin to say that, then you mustn't eat any steak or any chicken or anything. So that human beings are made that way. It's unfortunate, but uh, the way they have to eat. <laughs> so you, you don't object to hunting uh, itself, so long as it's properly regulated. I don't see what the difference it is to to to, to kill a deer after hunting and kill a, actually the way they kill cattle and pigs and things. In the slaughterhouses, it's much better. So it's very silly. Yeah. Now, of, of all the things that you are well known for, and there are many and various, probably your explorations in Indochina are the things for which you will always be best known. Oh, yeah. It's Indochina and all the work you did there. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you, you went to... I went China? in the end of 1923. Yes. 24. And I went there seven times, and I stayed each time seven, eight months. Yeah, and each time studying a different oh, well, yes. part of that. I covered country. most of the country. Yes. You never cover everything, but... Uh, it, it was a virtually unknown region, no. zoological. No, there was only collection made by old people who had just yes. been there. So it never been done. So the government was aware of that and asked me to do it, you see. Yes. And politically, was it stable and stable oh. and prosperous? Well, it's much safer than France and England today. Yes. Yeah. And very rich, with hospitals and schools everywhere. Throughout in the whole of Indochina? Now it's back to savage right now. Yes. How long had France ruled there when you first went out in the 20s? Had it been a colony for many years? Oh, yes, it had been a colony for well, it started in the 18th century. You know, as you know, there was a craze in Western Europe for uh, Asiatic things in those days. And at the court of Louis XV, the bishop of Belém, was a Frenchman, Frenchman, brought to Versailles the son and heir of the emperor of those days, who had been asking for help from Europe to modernize the country, it was a new dynasty starting. He had oh, oh, yes. And then uh, this boy came to the court of Louis XV, and they thought he was wonderful, and so on, and he was exotic and thing, and stayed there for many years. Then he went back and took with him French people to organize the country. Then they worked for the emperor, and the emperor, Kien Lung, uh, was very successful, he organized the whole country, and uh, they built uh, forts everywhere and all that. But his son persecuted the Christians. So, by that time, it was, I think, when, when was it? It was before Louis Philippe was king or something. Anyway, they had to send some French troops to save those heroes from being tortured, you see. Yes. And then they founded Saigon, which did not exist, you see. And made a little colony there. And then from there, there was more trouble in the country and so on. And they helped the emperor, the successor and so on, and put a protectorate on the whole thing. And that, was and that spread to Cambodia and Laos, which were a mess as they are now. 
But they had been wonderful countries, but Cambodia, but they were in full uh, decadence. And uh, they'd been beaten up by everybody else. And Laos actually asked for the French protectorate. They asked them to go in? Oh, yeah. Yes. And then, and then, that was it. And that was in 1830, 40, something. Okay. Yeah. About the same time as Burma and all that. Yes. And you were able to meet the, the emperor, the old emperor. Oh, really, yes. Um, yes, because you see, my, there was, when I went to Indochina, I'd heard of a, a civil service man called Pierre Jabouille, who was interested in birds and things, and had sent a few specimens in the museum. So when the governor general uh, appointed me as head of the natural history thing there, I naturally wanted to meet Jabouille. Yes. And he said, where is he? Well, he was in the country. That's just where I wanted to go, because that was the country on the coast of Anem, about the middle, like the mountain, where they had sent the crested Argus and Edward Pheasant and so on. There were two or three specimens in Paris, that yes. was. And uh, so I went there. Then we got lots of them. And so Quang Tree was your first base in, yeah. in Central... He was the resident of that province, you yes. see. Well, that was very easy. Yes. And yeah. was that where you were able to catch and um, bring back the... Yeah, they are all over the mountain there. Yes, in the mountains. The, 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 the native used to be held along the smack, the mountain. They made little hole with a, with a uh, uh, noose, and then he had to go at night with the pheasants, the ground cuckoos and the pit as they were walking up and down the thing yes. and get caught. Yes. And That's so where we got them. Trapped there, the Lots Edwards of. and the... the Actually, they were very common. Yes. But you don't see them. No. I never saw a crested dagger wild alive. And I don't believe anybody else did. No. They may have seen the Malay one of them. But the other one, no. I heard them called yes. 10 yards from me. Yes. But you don't see them. They are under the bushes. Yes. And the imperial... But you, you, put, you put traps and you get them immediately. I see. And the imperial pheasant, you caught just one pair, didn't you? Well, some yeah. missionaries sent them to me. They come from a little pocket of mountain. Yes. Now, I heard recently that uh, the Vietnamese, or whatever you call them now, uh, I found in another pheasant, but I don't trust it to it, maybe it'll be, which really looks like an Edward, but has a white tail. Yes. It's possible. We have heard... But until I've seen it, I don't believe it. We, we have not seen it. Well, the they don't know anything about it. Yeah. But yes. it's possible. Dr. Vo Kui came to the Second Peasant Symposium yeah, and talked don't. about it. Yeah, they don't but know But we have anything. not seen the specimen. <laughs> uh, well, you know, even also the Chinese are pretty good. They have found a new dragon. Yes. But I think it's a hybrid between the Deming and the Cabot, that's what it is. Yeah, we, we, Which we, is possible. It's possible. They're, they're, the territory overlaps. Huh? Yes. Well, we don't know. Is it? What sort of countryside? Well, you know, in the, the collections of Rochelle yeah. Collection Marrow in New York, there is a wild hybrid between a satyr and a blaze. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. w with the Imperial, what sort of countryside did they inhabit? Was it easy? Well, it's all, all small mountains, I mean, up to 6,000 feet, 7,000 feet, all broken in, and, you know, limestone country and so on. You can hardly go through it. No. Rocks and things. You, you know, the, it looks like the scenery you see on the old Chinese painting. You, go, you get that through the north of Indochina, and so China, it's very beautiful. Yes. But it's a devil of a place to get through. Yes. <laughs> yes. But there's nobody there. Yeah. And you used to send out your trappers to, to catch all your specimens, bring them into you. Oh, yeah. That's how it's well, done. The skins went to yes. Paris. And then after the second year, uh, the British Museum said to me, if you send, some, if you send somebody with you, we pay for him. Will you give us part of the collection? I said, yes. So they sent with me an old uh, Willow Below, who became a very dear old friend, who was a very good collector of skins. And then they had a number of specimens. Yes, yes. 
Uh, I think you told me once that uh, as you were sailing the, on the boat back into Saigon, some of the cages fell open and the, oh, yeah. the Imperials got out. Yeah, flew out and then it, it flew into a dock. There was a female and a young one. Yes. Uh, 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 and the female Imperial, I believe. Well, I never got more than one pair. I got some more, but they were rotten. <laughs> yes. And, and how did you catch them again? They flew out into the well, no, I didn't buy them. The, the lady had caught them. He caught them for you. And it was sent by a missionary. Yes. Yeah. When they flew out into the docks, how, how did you get them again? Because that's well, what you need. We, we, we landed yes, just very soon, you see. And then we rushed to the docks, got the, 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 the gates closed down, and then they were perched on the on the frame thing there, and oh, I, see. I got some boys yeah. to climb up and get them. In the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> you were very lucky. That was lucky. You were very lucky, because you, that's the only yeah. female imperial that ever came. Yeah. And they came back here to Clare, didn't they? Oh, yes. The imperial. And we reeled them. And we reeled them, yeah. read from them. Yeah, and they reeled too, I mean, they were. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah. Well, Jabu had them in his areas in the residency at Quartry there, but when I came there, They'd been sent by that missionary who had sent a few other things. Yes. And in naming them, you named them the Imperial Pheasant after the Emperor Kai Din, yes. who, who you had knew. Been very friendly yes. and all that. He, he liked birds, I think. Did he? he had quite a collection of yes. animals. Yes. And didn't you see during his reign the great ceremonies of Tet and, and um, Nam Jiao that were done for the, really the last time properly yes, in that's his true. time? Yeah. That was performed in China until the fall of the last emperor. Yes. Yeah. And were they very impressive ceremonies to witness for a European to see? Well, if you were invited, you yes. See. Yeah. Well, you, few of us were invited, but no men, actually, no yes. women. No women. Yeah. It was very, very, very interesting. Yes. And the costumes were wonderful. Yes. Completely different. exciting pheasants were found, but also you went up into the high mountains in Tonkin, didn't you, on the border with China? Oh, yeah. What did you find there? Mostly Chinese things. The, the, the Chinese fauna? Deming dragopheasants. Yes. Nobody knew it came that far south. Yeah. Yeah. But it was there just on top of the mountain. Yes. Which were more or less 10,000 feet. No. Yes. They don't come much below 10,000 feet. No. And the, uh, peacock pheasants also you, you found. Oh yeah, quite because they are way down, you see, are yes. tropical. Yes. Yeah. They are very far from the tragopen, I mean. Yes. You yes. don't get them together. Well, the tragopens are, there's nothing else in the way of pheasants. They are hill partridges. Yes. But not no other pheasants I can think of. They come from farther below, you see. And with these birds, which we always regard in agriculture as being rather difficult and special and fragile, how did you manage to ship them down to the coast and then um, travel them all the way to Europe? I took them with me, you know, they were cages made, you know. We well, had to be in those cages two, three months. Yes. In those days, you see, there was no air transportation. No. So it was very difficult, but when you manage it, but you had to look after them, it was yes. much more difficult. Yes. And how big and were these the cages? High mountain thing. Like the blood feather, who shall know who could in captivity anyway. Nobody has done anything good with them for you to speak of. And uh, they were being established properly. Why, I don't know, because they live exactly in the same place 
Have you five weapons and the well, no. Yes. And yet some reason, some they of the... Anyway, before the war, you did better got one here in good shape. They were always out dead or dead on the way. Yes. Because you couldn't stand the long coffee, you see. No. Now you get them, but they don't do much good. Did, did you keep them in very big cages on board ship, or were they small little boxes? Well, they were not too small. No. They were about each bird. It's important, a rare thing to have them one by one. Yes. Well, each bird had, uh, I would say, uh, um, 15 inches by uh, 40, something like that, compartments. And then you have to have proper places you could put out the water and the food and clean it and all that. And it had to be padded, otherwise it would be It was quite a business. Mm -hmm. Did you have difficulty making some of them eat the food that you could uh, supply? Not feathers, no. Yeah. They would we, eat. Can't, we can't cram feathers, mm -hmm. no. That's what they eat. Feathers are not difficult to eat, to feed. Pigeons are. Some pigeons won't eat. Yeah. Well, the food pigeons. Yes. <laughs> they want it, you have to cram them. Yes. Some have to cram for a month before they ate. For a month. Yeah. But not with pheasants. No. Yeah. They and always eat. You must have had to take on board an enormous supply of food to last yeah. your journey home. Oh, yes, food and everything. Oh, yes, and then on board the ship on the top, they build me a tent and I don't buy bird there. Yes. And I always had one of my native. Uh, Start with me to yes. prepare a lot of work. Yes. yes. And I always had big animals I gave to the Paris or London Zoo, you know. Tigers, uh, uh, clouded leopard, the candles, that sort of thing. You brought those back on ship as well? Well, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and two. Yes. It'd be very hard work for, what, eight weeks uh, voyage perhaps? No, it was, it was really. 25 days from Saigon to Marseille. 25 days at all? Yeah, but you have to come to Saigon sometimes to come here 10 days. Yes, yes. 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 Although it was much more difficult. Yes, indeed. And much more expensive. Yes. And did you have uh, uh, losses? Were there many birds lost? Sometimes, if you are not careful. Yes. The first lot of friends after I used to have all that, the fact they would go through and die. Yes. When they saved the few. We started with 30 something and then did seven. Well, then Gigi gave me a tip. I put some corrosive sublimate in the water and that stopped it. Yes. But you have to be careful not to give too much of it. Yes, of course. And that stopped the next stop. You didn't lose any. I see. You learn by experience. And... See, there's another danger. The natives catch your fans and they put them in a back basket, usually. By their door, and their chickens come and eat the food they eat the pheasants. And then they come into contact with the domestic chicken, the domestic chicken gives them the Yes. That's what happens. Yes. And did you find many birds were injured when catching them by the natives so that you couldn't use them for a, a life delivery? Well, somewhere we would give them medicines on them. Yeah. But you see, if you put the holes in the in the fences you put across the mountain where they go. So, if you put food, they are caught by the neck and killed. Yes. But if you don't put food, you put their foot and they are caught by the foot. Sometimes the foot is slightly injured, but not not too much. Yes. That's how you catch them. Yes. And then you catch them alive. But you have to go fairly often on the fences or where the wild cat come and eat them. Yes. Yes. And then you went to Laos, didn't you? Could, was there a road into Laos at that time, or did you have to go out by, by river? Oh, no. Laos was part of it, you see. But yes. Yes, it was just another state. And, well, well, Laos was interesting because it was uh, more western, but like Burma. And, uh, in fact, the, the last time we went there, we went on the border of Burma, Yunnan, Burma, Thailand, Laos, and that was particularly Burmese. Yes. There were no pheasants of any great interest. Yeah. 
And I remember you telling me you saw the Chinese Manal. Was that in China on your visit to, to China? I knew that's what it was. I had them. Mm. I had two females there. Here in captivity, exactly. Well, yeah. yeah. They put a common manual with them, and it was all the size. They had no Yes. And did they hybridize? The, 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 mm. No. Never. Yes. Never lived any. Mm. And then there was a pair in California, near Sacramento, in Southern Oaks, and that, that uh, this fellow, uh, Floyd Smith, I don't know, Floyd Smith, I don't know who bought it anyway. Uh, they were about 10 years, but it's hot in the summer, they never lived any. Mm. It's too hot. Oh, yeah. Mm. But this time, they got some from in San Diego Zoo last year, and they had young ones. Yes. I, have you seen I, them? Oh, yes, I yes, did see them. But uh, uh, I, I, I impressed upon them to have it in a very cool place and shady and all that. Yes. And she back the sheet, not too much. Mm -hmm. But they yeah. can't sell it. Yeah. It would be a great achievement if you we know, the, establish the yeah. Chinese pheasants. In, the, in my day, the Saigon Zoo was pretty good. And I got interested in them and put them food and gave them things. And I gave them Chinese feathers. Yes. Amherst Golden Reeves. Not. They live forever in that climate, you see? Yes. They were laying eggs. Yes. Yes. Well, we've mentioned America and those great zoos and San Diego. Let's go on now to what we might call the American um, part of your life, because in 1940 you had to leave Claire with the war and you went then to America and established yourself at, at the um, New York Zoological Society. The, um, what, why did you choose New York as a, as a base when... Um, well, because that's where, you know, that's where I knew people. Yes. And, um, I didn't choose anything. I got there. And then I saw friend there, the husbands and all these people. Yeah. And they said, well, if you want to... I needed to have something to do and some money. Because I had no money in America, not very much. No. I had some in England and some here and there. But I got something from England here, yeah, I could. So, uh, so they gave me a job. You know. Yes. And you worked there um, really until you went to Los Angeles? Yes. But no, until 47. Then I found I needed more time to come here. Mm. And uh, so there are no vacations in America, it's not like Europe, you know. You have two weeks vacation, that's all. And... <laughs> they work too hard. Uh, well, better for them. And uh, so I, I, I had to get it up. But I used to spend one day out of two in the zoo and the other day in an office I still have in the museum. Yeah. And then in 1951 you went to be director of the Department of History and um, Science in Los Angeles. Yeah. That must have been a very exciting new... Well, I used to go to California a lot before the war, and all I knew a lot of it. And then there's a county museum, which an art museum, natural history museum, and history museum. And it's a department of the county. And then, uh, well, they had difficulties there. And the director who made trouble with everybody, was a good friend of him. And then uh, I knew a number of people on the board appointed by the county and some of the county supervisors. And they wrote to me and he said, it's a mess here. Would you like to come and, and restore it for us? And then when I, all my friends in New York said, I don't want to go there, you'll be in trouble. But so I, I went and I was not in trouble at all. <laughs> I stayed there until I retired when I was to be 70. They thought that was old. Yeah. Yeah. And that's already the end of the war. Yeah. <laughs> so you were there for 24 years. Yes. Yeah. And at the same time, you were re establishing and opening Claire. Uh, oh, after yeah. its destruction in the Second World War. Yeah. She first came back here, came to New York. He had been here, and uh, 
Like said, well, do you think it can be restored? You said, oh yes, it can be restored, and we can make enough money from this either. So, so I said, all right, well, you go along and do some money left. And uh, so, one of the we did it up, it never was like before, naturally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nothing was. You, you've seen all the great private collections and all the zoos of uh, uh, importance in the world over mm-hmm. an enormous time. How do, say, the zoos that we have now compare with what you've known in the early part of this century? Well, some are better, some are worse. Mm-hmm. London used to be, well, the accommodation were old fashioned. But it was the best collection in the world. And now it still is old fashioned. And the new things I've made are not terribly good. And the collection is down to nothing. And that, I don't know. I was connected with Antwerp for the last two years, I've not been there. She's Vandenberg, the director, Ries Dottil, Ries Ein and died. And they had business people, they didn't think it was a success because they had to replace it. So I just don't know how it goes. You know, everywhere it had these ups and downs all yes. the time. Yes. Uh, uh, New York, after me, wasn't too good for, for the number of years. Not too bad, but not too good. But since Conway has been there, it is the best manager in the world, and the best collection, and the best accommodation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's high price. So I knew it still is pretty good. Yeah. And uh, it's a very good collection, of course, it's a wonderful planet. And they make money 12 months a year. Yes. It does make a difference. Yeah, it helps a great deal. You see, here in a cold winter country, you don't make any money yeah. uh, in the winter. Yeah. But uh, that goes on everywhere, really. It goes up and down according to people and circumstances. So. Well, over 20 years ago, when you wrote your old perhaps you were an anachronism as well. Do you still feel that, or do you feel that you're a prophet who's being proved right? Oh, I don't know. I think the world's going to pot, really. And there are too many human beings, and they damage things too much, and they, and, uh, they get less and less civilized. But uh, there's no, nothing which cannot be improved in the end, so we'll start. <laughs> You're still hopeful for us. Yeah. When you wrote, you said you were you had a fear of home-filled misery developing all over the world, and um, maybe that's still possible. Yeah, well, I lack too many human beings. There's not enough resources for them. Yes. And that's the fatal thing. I don't know what we get to do. Yeah. We should yeah. kill off half, half of the world population, but I don't have to do it nicely to you. Yeah. 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 You want to tell me you were mildly in favour of cannibalism? Yeah, as long as I'm not concerned myself. in Indochina are the things for which you will always be best known. Oh, 